Welcome to the self-guided mini course on communicative language teaching. I'm Dr. Ankel Botaine, and I'm so excited that you are ready and willing to learn this method for language teaching because it, because it is far more effective than traditional methods. You will love it, your students will love it. It's a profound change, but if you're here, you're ready for that change. And this course will give you all the tools that you need to make that change as well as lots of opportunities to pursue your own understanding and to work independently. So let's start with the basics. What is communicative language teaching? Communicative language teaching is actually harder to adopt than many people think. It sounds simple, but it's actually very difficult for many people to learn because it is a drastic departure from traditional methods. And there's also not many places where you can easily learn this method. Not much is available, which is why this mini course has been created. Communicative language teaching targets communicative competence. This is based in the work of Del Himes, which you may be familiar with. Um, it's based in uh, the concepts of linguistic anthropology. Communicative competence is the ability to be confident and easily understood when communicating in a language, even if one doesn't master every grammatical aspect or every possible vocabulary word of that language, which of course is the case for almost every speaker of every language. But communicative competence is what learners are really seeking. This is taught through communicative scenarios and practice, meaning we learn to communicate by practicing communicating. We don't learn to communicate by reading books about communicating or by studying rules about communicating or by memorizing uh, aspects of communication, we learn by actually doing it. So the teacher is going to be transforming their entire classroom to foster the practice of communicative scenarios, which are always to some degree authentic. Uh, you'll see that this requires a lot of the teacher, um, but essentially the method of communicative language teaching is, is defined in two aspects. First, by what is being taught, communicative skills, and second, by how it is being taught meaning the student is actually experiencing communicative scenarios and actually going through the process of attempting to communicate in order to gain those skills. There's not a separation of theory and practice. Some examples of what we're trying to avoid. I have a couple of personal stories that I think really illustrate why communicative language teaching is so important. So one example is that I lived for many years in, in Jordan, which is an Arabic speaking country. And um, during those years, the level of English was predominantly fairly low. Although students did take English classes every single year of school. So once I was visiting a relative and the mother of the family told me that their eldest daughter was doing really well in English and she was really proud of her English skills. And she said, uh, speak to her in English which I wasn't accustomed to doing. I was accustomed to always using Arabic there. But I said, great, that's so great. Let's talk in English. And so the little girl approached me. She was in about the seventh grade at the time. So you can calculate that she'd had between six and eight years of English classes. And I said to her, good morning. And she looked at me and her eyes got really wide and her mouth dropped open. And she just stared terrified at me. And after a long pause, I looked at the mother and I said, is, is she okay? And the little girl looked at her mother and said in Arabic, even though she knew I could understand Arabic, she was so terrified. And she looked at the mother and she said, I don't know the answer. And what I realized at that moment is that although she'd been saying good morning in her classes for all of those six to eight years every single day, She'd never actually engaged in the communication of saying, good morning, how are you? What's going on? What have you been up to? She'd never experienced anything like that. And so literally the very first moment that she encountered true communication, where I said, good morning, and I was looking for a response, the response of course being, good morning, she was so unprepared for that moment that she froze and therefore had a negative experience. This is highly demotivating. The inability to really use what you have been studying for eight years is highly demotivating. And so um, we want to make sure that students have success in those, in those experiences because one thing that happens 
uh, is that they quit the language if, if, if they have the choice to. They will, they will disengage from the language as much as possible upon having those negative experiences. Um, and in fact, that child no longer studies English and has opted to study Turkish um, because she did not feel that she was gaining any competence. That's very understandable. So we want to avoid a scenario like that for our students, that they feel that we've wasted their life. Um, other examples, um, many of us have encountered students who are top students, very high achievers from um, East Asian countries. Um, I, I personally have met a number of Korean students who have excellent reading and writing skills, but who would prefer to write uh, the, the, the basic uh, information that they're trying to uh, communicate um, rather than to speak it. Um, I've also encountered this with a few Chinese students um, for whom the pronunciation is even more difficult, I think, um, and moving from a tonal language to a stress language could be really hard. And since their teachers were not trained in how to teach speaking and perhaps themselves struggled with speaking, um, they taught what they were good at, which is what most teachers are good at, which is reading and writing. So you have students who are really good in reading and writing and who then get thrust into a situation where they were doing tourism or they've come as an exchange student and they would prefer to write their message because they've practiced that and they feel confident with that. But what that means is that they're not experiencing the joy and the success of authentic natural communication according to the cultural norms. Again, those are students who, are, who would be understandably frustrated and may feel that we've wasted many years of their life. So we want to teach communication because communication is what people are really aiming for. It's what motivates them. It's what makes them feel that they are successful in this language and they want to continue. This demands of the teacher to fundamentally change everything we know about how to organize a course and how to organize a lesson. It's also going to demand to change how we organize our classroom and how we interact with our students and approach their diagnose and address their needs because it's all going to come from this perspective of what are their capacities for communication in which situations can they communicate and so the teacher you will see in some examples later is going to be very much become an actor very much become a stage director very much become an event planner and uh, a theater writer who is going to co construct these scripts and these scenarios and who's going to act out the, the experiences that we can anticipate our students having in genuine context, in authentic context. Um, and they're going to fundamentally rearrange how the course begins, continues, and ends, and how students are assessed. So this is a profound departure from traditional language methods. So teachers should know that as with any transformational learning experience, it's going to take a lot of time, trial and error. One is going to need to be very humble and teachable, ask a lot of questions, analyze one's own progress, and be open to making mistakes and be open to not knowing things, because there are going to be some challenging moments. Um, but you will see a drastic increase in productive language skills among your students, motivation, engagement, commitment to the language. One thing that is very commonly asked about this approach when we say we're teaching students to communicate is that people will ask, well, at up to what level can we use this method? Which um, signals that they think of communication as something super basic, something you do when you're a beginner, something you do when you're not able to do something uh, more advanced or more respectable. That is a totally false understanding of what communication is. Um, so we can start from the premise that everything is communication. Everything we teach in school is communication. Every subject area is communication. Science is learned, is presented, is tested and verified through communication. Math is learned, experimented with, taught, and checked, negotiated through communication. So if you want to become an, uh, an expert physicist, a huge part of what you need to learn is physics communication. And the way that you will learn all of your physics is through communication, academic communication. There's also everyday communication. And everyday communication is different 
for five-year-olds than it is for 45-year-olds, than it is for 85-year-olds. So communication never stops. Communication is the basis of all human interaction. Um, so we can scale communicative language teaching up to any level and apply it to any topic, any content area. So if you're struggling with how to adapt this method to your particular teaching context, please reach out. You'll have contact information throughout this module. We will help you um, tailor the content of your course to the communication skills that you are targeting. Here's your first opportunity to work on your own. Here's your first opportunity to work on your own. You'll be opening a Padlet. A Padlet is a sort of an interactive web page with multimedia content that anyone can use in their classes and that I encourage people to play around with a little bit. It has a little bit of a learning curve, but it can be very useful for language teachers. So open the Padlet at this address and um, review the first column of information, the origins of communicative language teaching. There are articles and videos in multiple languages. You can use the language that is most comfortable for you um, so that you understand where this idea, this concept comes from and what the true aims of this concept are, as well as you'll be able to connect the linguistic concept to some do's and don'ts in the classroom. So spend as much time as is useful for you independently reviewing this column of the Padlet, and then we'll be reviewing the other sections at other points throughout the course. So pause this video now, open the Padlet, and review that section until you feel that you have a strong understanding. The biggest question that arises with communicative language teaching, and so we're addressing it already in our second section of this course, is how do I do it? There are a lot of philosophical questions about communicative language teaching, and there are a lot of small details. But I'm gonna start by giving you a real brief overview of basically how you do communicative language teaching. So the very short explanation is, you pick a real life situation that you want your students to be able to navigate. You spend significant time imagining in great detail how that situation actually occurs. What do they actually need to be prepared to produce and understand in that authentic scenario? Then you set about teaching them in a systematic way, and we'll talk about what that systematic way is in later sections, um, how to communicate, how to understand and produce everything that they will need for a successful negotiation of that scenario in an authentic setting. And then you practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Repetition is vital to language learning. There is no way to avoid it. You can reflect on your years as a toddler or more likely toddlers you have seen acquiring their first language. And you can see how much repetition is part of toddler life. And you can see by every six-year-old who becomes a fluent speaker of their L1 that repetition works. So there is no communicative language teaching without repetition. And the teacher's job is to help students come to accept and embrace that and to understand why. So there will be practice both um, exact repetition, as well as what we call spiral sequencing, which we'll address uh, in a later section, where the same situation will recur in new formations, such that students have a chance to practice its elements in different combinations. And you're always going to be thinking about possible variations. So what would happen if this, um, if, if this situation suddenly went in a different way, particularly what would happen if there were breakdowns in communication? So you'll be practicing each of the variations on multiple occasions until mastery is achieved. And over time, you'll want to maintain memory and comfort with that previously mastered skill. We're now going to break that down into several sections. First, I said, pick a real life situation. Now, a real life situation, as I said, continues to occur at all ages, at all levels. There's nobody who's done with real life uh, situations until you're done with life. So for newcomers, 
this might mean a, a scenario that we really do want them to navigate introducing themselves particularly to a person of authority which, where they might be expected to um, respond more quickly and perhaps would be accommodated to less and would need to have more information at the ready or um, perhaps a more complex but mundane daily task where they may want to change to their school schedule they need to address people appropriately explain what they need and navigate the answers that they receive even for newcomers these are pretty complicated scenarios at other levels we might think about for younger children how do we fight over a toy while using the target language if we're in an immersion setting with um, young children we want them to have even their problems through the target language as much as possible. We can think about with adults or um, upper grade students, how to give a speech about public policy, how to organize one's thoughts, how to have convincing delivery, how to have the appropriate information at the ready. There are more uh, informal moments of communication, like writing a postcard. So students, um, may need to use writing um, in informal settings as well as informal settings we always think of writing as academic writing but there's lots of types of writing in the world of course in the academic context they will eventually have to learn how to persuade someone in a five paragraph essay these are all forms of communication these are all communicative scenarios where success is determined by how well you communicate so bear in mind that the situation can, and often should, integrate new knowledge or content knowledge. So when we talk about content knowledge, we mean science, math, history, social studies, physical education, home economics, um, citizenship, whatever types of subjects we might teach them in school are often integrated into language learning, both because they give us the scenarios that we want to uh, have students communicate through, but also because students need to be learning that at the same time. So integration is almost always uh, the desirable approach, and um, in some really ideal scenarios, the teachers of content and language are the same teachers, and they teach all of those together. So even if you're in a standalone language classroom or you're a push-in, pull-out sort of support teacher, always think about the opportunities offered by integrating content teaching with language teaching. Um, examples of that might be dramatizing a novel. This is an English language art skill or a language art skill uh, that everybody learns in school, but it is also a communication style. It is a scenario of communication arguing your side of a scientific debate, both knowledge and communication. How to build a solar powered car, both knowing how to do it and communicating about it. These are all real life situations that we can choose. Uh, there will be resources at the end of this course for project-based language learning, which we strongly encourage teachers to use as a course format so that all communication is leading to the completion of a task, a real life problem solving task that reinforces the authentic nature of communication, its use, as well as it engages students in actually learning about uh, topics and actually solving problems that genuinely interest them, even if language learning in itself isn't their favorite thing. Here's another chance for you to work independently. Just take some time and think about your students' age, proficiency level, topics of interest, be aware that when I say topics of interest, I mean their topics of interest, not your topics of interest. Your topics of interest might work in a few scenarios, but you're the teacher. You chose a career in this. They didn't. Many of them didn't even have a choice about being in this class. So um, pick something that genuinely interests them, and you go learn about it, and you go figure out how to in integrate it into your classroom, rather than forcing them to be interested in what you're interested in. That's called student-centered pedagogy. We want as much as possible, we want the course to involve topics that they already want to know about, that they already care about, that they already enjoy. And we're just doing that through the target language so that the target language becomes a means to enjoyment for them. 
Then go ahead and list as many scenarios as you can think of within those topics and within their um, level and their age group where they would need to communicate with someone else. So this is going to be a huge list. You're gonna spend a lot of time on this. Just list, 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 list those scenarios where they are going to be communicating. Keep listing. However much you listed, list more. Keep this as an open list that you have on a wall somewhere, in a journal, on an app on your phone, where you are constantly, 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 constantly thinking of communicative scenarios that are actually real and meaningful for your students and where you think about what communication skills they need to navigate the that in the target The second language. step of our communicative language teaching implementation is that after we've chosen the scenario that we want them to successfully navigate through communication, we need to really think about that scenario. This is especially important for those teachers who are teaching their native language. If your native language is English and you are teaching English, you are at a huge disadvantage here because you never went through the awkwardness of learning how to complete these communicative scenarios. So you are not that aware of all the little things that can go wrong, all the weird little idioms that people use that don't actually translate well, uh, all the odd habits that come up. You haven't experienced that as an outsider. So if you are at that disadvantage, you need to do your best now to transform yourself into that outsider, to look at your own cultural group as an alien would. And so you need to script out how these conversations go, how these interactions go. So if the interaction is that I am returning uh, a suit that I rented and I have stained it, script out that interaction. What is the shopkeeper going to say? What is the client going to say? What is the shopkeeper going to say? What is the client going to say? Really script it out as if, again, as if you are a playwright, a theater director, and include variations. Think about what would happen if this shopkeeper was super nice? What would happen if this shopkeeper was extremely strict? What would happen if the shopkeeper was prejudiced against second language speakers and made a big deal about not understanding the person's accent. This happens. Your students will experience that. Think about those variations. So it's a little bit like a choose your own adventure. <laughs> um, come up with the different ways that this scenario can unfold and script them out. When doing so, consider the background knowledge that a student will need. Think about things like nonverbal cues that can happen. Think about facial expressions. Think about hand gestures that people can use that are positive, negative, and neutral. Think about social norms. Include things like the volume of voice. Think about gender. Think about age. How do those play into these things? There are certain ways we speak to a shopkeeper when he's 35 that we don't speak to a shopkeeper when he's 75. Think it through. This is all knowledge that you as a fluent speaker or as a, a native speaker of the language have in your mind but you don't think about it as knowledge, and so you need to pull it out and really look at it like an alien would, and you need to write it all down so that you will remember to teach them that information. So create a detailed scenario with all of its possible variations. Consider also historical context. So when, um, when a shopkeeper is using certain phrases or uh, making a big deal out of someone's accent, What's the historical context of immigrants to that country? What's the historical context of non-native speakers of the language? Is this something where it's just so novel to them and they just think it's so interesting that someone's learning their language and they might say, what a cute way that you talk. Or are they saying, if you don't speak our language, you shouldn't even be in our country. What's the context here? Students need to know. You have all think of that deeply. information in your brain as a fluent speaker or as a native speaker. It's just a matter of emptying out everything you know, writing it all down and teaching it to your students, implicitly and explicitly. Modeling it for them, explaining it to them, preparing them for it. Make sure they are prepared for all of the different factors that are coming into this scenario. Of course, the complexity that they'll be aware of will increase with their level but you are the resource for them to understand the richness of each communicative scenario.
Possible breakdowns in communication can range from discriminatory refusal to understand to simply, I didn't hear you, or um, your student may have a tendency to mispronounce a certain phoneme, certain letter that constantly confuses the listener. They may have a difficult time saying certain words, and it would be good for them to know another word that they could throw out to clarify which word they were going for. Think about those breakdowns, and what are some strategies that can help them navigate those breakdowns successfully? All communication has breakdowns. It's just a matter of thinking consciously about what do we do when they happen? What do they sound like when they happen? And finally, get to know your students and understand who they are going to be in these scenarios. Think about their sexual orientation. Think about their gender identity. Think about their ethnic and national background. How are those factors gonna play in? What are they gonna to wanna to be able to say about themselves? What are they gonna to wanna to be able to understand about other people? How are they gonna be perceived? Are there accommodations they need to make for the fact that they are second language speakers? The fact that they are maybe visible minorities? Are they going to face certain hostilities? Or are they going to perhaps face um, undue privileges? Think about your students' individual capabilities and the perceptions of them, as well as their identities on every level, and prepare them accordingly. Here's a chance for you to work independently once again. Open up the Padlet and work on the second column, the competences inventory. This is a tool that lists out all of the skills that research has shown second language learners must master in order to be highly proficient, highly competent speakers of an additional language. There's a video tutorial on how to use this inventory, and this inventory can be your course guide, and it can also give you some ideas for how to build these competences in each lesson with your students. So spend some time exploring that. You can make a custom list of the competences you want to target, and you can think about ways that you could be offering them skills and competences with more detail, accommodating more variation, perhaps more individualized to the speaker and the listener that you can anticipate they will have in their communicative scenarios. So spend the time you need with the tutorial and the tool so that you can use it in planning your classes. Pause this video now and open the, the Padlet. Spend the time you need to deeply understand the role of competences in planning your course. The third step in our super simple process, <laughs> which you're finding out is pretty complicated, is to systematically teach our students how to communicate. We've talked about coming up with the scenario and inventorying the phrases and the skills that they need to successfully navigate that scenario. Um, when we present it to the students, we want to make sure that they clearly understand what the goal is of this lesson. So they clearly understand the scenario they're going to be navigating. This often means acting it out, having props, taking them to a location, transforming our room. Somehow we want them to be totally clear on what our goal is for communicating today. That's where the lesson needs to start. That's part of our system, is that the comprehension of what's going on needs to be totally clear so that they're then just adding on the layer of how to say or how to listen to what's going on. They're not actually confused about what's happening in the scenario. And in some cases where you have stark cultural differences, you may need to very carefully build up to that or provide lots of scaffolding to achieve that clarity. You're gonna be modeling the phrases. We're gonna to refer to them as chunks. You'll find out soon that in construction grammar, chunks or phrases are not complete sentences, but they are strings of words that go together that serve a purpose. You're gonna be modeling them the way they're really used. You're gonna be using authentic pronunciation to the extent possible. You might be slowing down, you might be clarifying a little bit, but you're going to be giving your students as clear and realistic a feeling of what this communication sounds like, what it looks like, as you possibly can. Um, so this is going to be authentic to the situation. In a scientific debate, that's a very formal level of language. When you're negotiating with a dry cleaner or a suit rental place, it's a less formal level of language. They're going to be authentic to the situation. You're going to provide an immense amount of choral repetition and practice for pronunciation. Pronunciation is very, very key for communication because most communication is oral. So it doesn't do us any good 
to have students who are really competent in reading and writing if they can't orally express their ideas. So we need lots of repetition. And mind you that when we change languages, we often change phoneme sets, which means that the muscles in our in our cheeks and our jaw are not accustomed to that phoneme set. And you will actually feel pain uh, when you begin speaking another language. Even I, as a multilingual person, um, when I suddenly change countries and suddenly speak a new language all day, every day that I wasn't speaking before, I feel soreness in my muscles. So students need literal training in getting their mouth to make the sounds that they need and and when you're doing this in chunks you're you're teaching them the pronunciation the prosody the stress that goes for the whole phrase so they know how to produce the whole phrase as a unit this models natural language acquisition this models l1 that language acquisition you can look at toddlers and see all the chunks that they know uh, you can think about yourself when you use phrases like i could care less or going to hell in a handbasket that we don't actually think about what the constituents of those phrases mean, we just know when to use them, and we produce them as one functional unit. Um, you'll read the research on this in a minute, but you'll be providing lots of repetition to get those chunks down, get the feel for those chunks in those cheeks. And then there's going to be small group and one-on-one -on -one practice, so you're still going to have your I do, we do, you do. You're going to provide some independent practice, some gradual release of responsibility. Now is your chance to work independent. Now is your chance to work independently. Dig into the idea of vocabulary teaching through chunks, through construction grammar, which is part of a larger field called usage-based linguistics. The idea of usage-based linguistics is that we don't study languages according to their rules, which, as you know, as a native speaker of your L1, you don't walk around with a rule set in your head. So we don't want to teach based on a rule set that someone has described. We want to teach based on how chunks of language actually function in interactions. And so that comes from usage-based linguistics, which studies which chunks are usually strung together, how frequently they occur, which ones are the most useful for us to learn first, and the scenarios in which those chunks get employed. So take a few moments, go as deep as you want to go, open the Padlet, Open the third column, and you'll have both written and video resources on understanding phraseology, the use of chunks or constructions, and their basis in usage-based linguistics. Spend as much time with that as is useful for you. Pause this video now and work independently on the Padlet. We said that the next step after we've sketched out our scenario and we've scripted it out and we've considered all the variations is to practice, 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 practice. That repetition is part of language learning. You learned your L1 through years and years and years of repetition. We don't want to take years and years and years for them to learn their L2, so we're going to squish it together and we're going to do lots of repetition in each lesson. The first step is that every lesson needs to provide a genuine need to communicate, so something that we want to get done. This is very often going to be a game. You guys going to be a little theater sketch. Um, it can be a lot of things, but a genuine need to communicate where these chunks, these constructions that we are teaching, um, help them to achieve a goal. However small, however silly, we want them to have fun, but we want them to experience achieving successful communication, getting things done through language. While they're practicing, you're going to notice that different students will acquire the chunks at different rates and that some chunks are more challenging than others. Some interactions involve more chunks than other interactions. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you? Very simple. You can do it on day one. But when you get into your returning your, seat, your suit to the rental place and you've stained it, you have a long back and forth that's going to happen. And so sometimes that's too much for people to remember all in one go. So you're going to provide prompts. You're going to provide additional repetition, additional input, and other forms of scaffolding, which you'll learn about in more depth later, to help get them through so that they can experience that success without having to have everything perfectly mastered at the beginning, because we know that that won't be the case. But we still want them to be able to achieve those greater tasks. Again, repeat, repeat, repeat. Sometimes there's identical repetition within one lesson, but we don't want to teach the same lesson five times. It's boring. 
So what we do is we do what's called spiral sequencing, spiral planning, um, and again, there's more resources on this later, um, to bring back the same skills that we previously worked on in new formations, to weave them through into new activities, because language is a set of skills that we use over and over and over again. And so our course is going to naturally model that. Uh, and that's going to provide a chance for the one who didn't master it the first time to get on board the second time or the fourth time or the eighth time. It's also going to remind us we may have mastered it and then forgotten it. It's also going to provide a chance to deepen the knowledge. So yes, you can say, hi, how are you? But now the third or fourth time we're learning it, we might learn what to do if someone says, actually, I'm not that well. My father just passed away. How do we handle that? We need to deepen that knowledge at all times. So every skill that you saw in the competences inventory has layers, has levels, and you'll be deepening that as you go through. And of course, you as a teacher need to formatively assess your students' progress. So you need to always be setting up activities that are gonna let them use their skills independently so that you can see which ones have been mastered and which ones haven't, and who needs more support and where. As well as, of course, there are summative assessments where students get to see their own progress marked throughout the months, semester, years. Now it's time for you to work independently. You're going to be reviewing, hopefully, these are not new concepts, but these are key concepts in all pedagogy that everybody needs to use. Every teacher of everything, all the time. But you're going to be reviewing them in the, concept, in the context of teaching a language. So the Padlet will help you. You can review the column entitled Everyday Pedagogy Basics. To spend some time making sure that you both understand and are, and are consistently using backwards planning, meaning starting from your goal and working backwards, never planning a course from day one forward. That's a recipe for not getting where you want to go. Always planning backwards that you understand how to create summative assessments that are performative assessments, that are authentic assessments, but that allow you to see clearly which skills have been mastered and which not. That you understand how to create and use rubrics as a way for both you and the student to measure their progress. That you know how to include formative assessments at a certain level of frequency. I like to say a minimum of once a week, depending on what your classroom is structured like. Um, uh, that you have regular formative assessments that are being used and that they are quality formative assessments that give you real detailed nuanced information to help you go forward in your teaching. That you know how to uh, use spiral scaffolding, meaning bringing the same task back enough times in enough new formations that mastery is achieved the learning is retained across time and it is deepened at each step. And as well uh, as scaffolding. Scaffolding needs to always occur. So spiraling is a form of scaffolding, um, which is that there's repetition, as we've said, but there's also things like written supports, visuals, um, sentence frames, cues, teacher intervention, there's many forms of scaffolding that you should be using. Every lesson should contain some scaffolding to help students reach just beyond their mastered level and constantly increase their skills. Let's take a look at some examples of communicative language teaching in action and get an idea of what the classroom looks and sounds like when this method is being used. Uh, what you'll notice are some commonalities in the classroom environment, regardless of the language being taught, regardless of the L1 of the learners, regardless of the setting, and even regardless of the age of the learners, because the method has a lot of commonalities to it. So these are ways in which your classroom is going to change, and ways in which you can identify when the method is being effectively implemented. So let's have a look at these examples one at a time, just a few minutes of each.
Let's watch a second example. Keep your eyes out for how the room looks and how the class sounds. Gabika. 
One final example, pay attention to what you hear, even though you don't know the language is being used. What does the lesson sound like? So hopefully you noticed some commonalities about how the class area looks. Um, <clears throat> while there are instances where everyone is sitting and there are instances where everyone is standing, there is no difference between the teacher and the students according to who is sitting and who is standing. And whether or not people are sitting or standing is a function of the activity they are engaged in. So it's not just a traditional classroom where people are sta static at their assigned spots. In fact, it's a dynamic environment where everyone's body is involved in the activity that's going on and therefore their posture is a function of the activity that they are participating in. So everyone is physically participating at all times. There's also not a clear hierarchy or division between the students and the teacher. In fact, it may have taken you a moment to figure out who the teacher was. Um, and that is partly a function of being on the same level uh, because you are engaged in communication and it is a generally a free-flowing and authentic communication. So the teacher has a need to listen, understand, and successfully communicate just like everyone else in the room does. It can also be a function of the fact that circles are often preferred to rows. Rows are for copying down information which isn't a very big part of a communicative language teaching class. Communication happens face-to-face. -face. So circles are generally the default mode 
um, for certain games or certain activities. Uh, other shapes may be used, but the default mode of communicating all of us together, all talking to each other, would be a circle. And so many traditional class classrooms will need some significant reorganization to accommodate a communicative method. You also notice that movement happens according to the activity, but even when there isn't movement to participate in the activity, there are gestures. And those gestures help uh, clarify the meaning of words and also help with retention of chunks, phrases, constructions that are being taught. Gestures are very important and they should not be optional in the classroom. Everyone should make the gesture at all times while learning and reviewing the focal chunk of the lesson. You'll notice that there are different cultures around things like pointing, things like standing up, of course, different gestures have different meanings. So the teacher actually needs to put a lot of thought into the classroom gestures, what they will be, what they will mean, how they will be used, by whom they will be used, um, before creating a culture around those gestures. But the, those gestures become very powerful in ameliorating communication, as well as in aiding in retention of the oral language. You'll also notice that there are many props and scaffolds. Not all of them are visible in the video because there are some um, cards that are too small to see. There are, of course, uh, many objects that are being passed around. Um, but everything has a physical incarnation. It's not just a theoretical discussion about ideas. There are physical objects. There are written supports that are being used. Even though writing is not being used as a teaching medium, which is very important because speech cannot be taught through writing. Speech can only be taught through speech. But there are lots of scaffolds that can be made with paper, on a whiteboard, out of index cards, um, using dice. There are many different ways um, in which uh, performance at a higher level can be scaffolded using physical objects, visual cues, and writing. You'll also notice that there are uh, there's a consistent theme of using games. Now, I call these games and, quote, games, close quote, because uh, there are such things as games where there's an actual competition going on. Um, and so you can see people running up to slap the, the board with a fly swatter. You see these kind of games happening. But, and sometimes you might be playing Monopoly or Clue or Guess Who, familiar games. But there are also games, in quotes, that the teacher builds into every single lesson. And so they are a way where the communication is needed to complete one's role in the game, taking one's turn, fulfilling one's role, but they don't actually have any competition to them. There's no winning or losing. And if anyone struggles, they will be supported by the others and then by the teacher if necessary. So an example of everyone rolling the dice and stating what colors they rolled, um, these are dice with colors on each side, is a sort of a game in which everyone has a, has a turn and plays and finds out what they get, but no one's result is better than anyone else, so it's non-competitive. This allows the students to focus on the language. In my personal classes, there are probably 15 non-competitive games for every one competitive game, and I adjust that according to the personality and the culture of the students. If they become very competitive, I reduce competitive games and increase increase cooperative games or games with no competi competition element. So you see a lot of movement, you see a lot of coordinated gestures and coordinated cooperation toward the games. Some sounds that you will be hearing in the classroom, probably the main one is choral repetition. Speech can only be taught through speech. Those cheek muscles can only learn to make the sounds if they have enough practice. Since we don't have years of immersive living for students to acquire the language through repetition, it becomes a part of the lesson, it becomes a culture of the course. So that choral repetition where they not only have a chance to practice, but they can also hear one another, they can hear themselves, the teacher can hear and check how they're doing, is very important and takes place at many points throughout the lesson. This also allows for the transmission uh, orally of proper pronunciation and prosody. That word cut off there is prosody. That means where the stress goes, where the emphasis is in the phrase. So when we teach in chunks, 
We teach in phrase, partly we do that so that students will know how to string the chunks together in an authentic situation. And that means knowing where the emphasis goes. And so by using choral repetition, by not using writing as a medium, by having students listen very carefully to the teacher's pronunciation, what we attain is a very high level of accuracy in both pronunciation and prosody. So both the rhythm and the individual sounds of the words are very accurate through this method. Students have a very high level of success. It also allows them to better hear phonemes that are unfamiliar to them because they are learning through listening as opposed to learning through seeing it written. So they're listening for those cues, they're hearing those unfamiliar phonemes from the very first lesson. You sh should also have picked up on a lot of positive error correction. So when an error was made or when pronunciation was a struggle, the teacher offered a correction, not to directly to the student, but to the entire group, and then initiated more choral repetition to make sure that the error was clarified. So to make sure that there were more positive examples of the correct version than there were mistakes for everyone's learning, but also without cornering the student, always as a help, as a support. And students also helped each other by offering up the correct form. So there are many different techniques for error correction. That's a whole issue unto itself. But there's a lot of positive, productive, non-confrontational, non-accusatory error correction that goes on in a communicative language classroom. You may also have noticed significant wait time. So there can be prolonged silences. The teacher gets to know through choral repetition, really gets to know what students look like when they're working toward saying something that they have learned and when students are quiet because they don't know. And that attunement to the students, which is happening through the constant communication, allows the teacher to know how long wait time is appropriate. So you heard lots of silences in all of the classes because the teacher knew that the student was going to be able to come up with some part of what they wanted to say and therefore would be able to stay in the language and get help to work through the breakdown. You also heard students using long chunks, sometimes entire sentences, prolonged phrases, several phrases strung together. All of these are level one classes. None of these students have significant prior experience with the language. They're all able to do this within a matter of days or weeks because they've been taught the chunks and they simply string them together. But those long strings of chunks are required for authentic communication, to work through an authentic situation. So you heard students giving complete ideas and then complete responses. And that is the focus of the uh, lessons which are then spiraled together to create long strings of chunks that students can use to complete increasingly complex communicative scenarios. Now it's time for you to work independently. You're going to be thinking critically um, about the attributes of effective language teaching that leads to speaking, that leads to communicative competence. You're going to be analyzing some model lessons to decide whether they meet all the criteria, whether they implement best practices or not. And this is a pro preparation for you to analyze your own lessons and your colleagues' lessons and to think critically about how they could be improved. So open the, the Padlet and review the column Effective Teaching for Speaking. You have a list of attributes that are recommended to be used in order to maximize communicative competence. And you have a set of lessons, both video and described in writing, that you can analyze according to this framework. Spend as much time as you need critically analyzing these so that you'll be prepared to critically analyze your own lessons. We know that a whole new approach cannot be adopted overnight. This is a huge learning process, and you'll need some help. So there are different tools and supports available in the Padlet that you can access anytime. There are templates that you can download or make a copy of in Google Drive and use over and over to help guide your planning. There are also links to idea boards like the Competences Inventory and a project-based language learning site called Revital Learn, where teachers share um, ideas for project-based learning units that teach language. 
as well as there's contact information if you'd like personalized coaching, help converting your institution to a more communicative and student-centered format, or if you'd like to have consultations on how you could develop your course or your program in a way that focuses on communicative competence and student-centered learning, so real-life tasks. I am available to help, and your questions are always welcome. Please interact via the comment section or the Padlet. You also have our email within the Padlet and here at the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for embracing this new method. We hope it's nothing but fun for you and your students. We look forward to hearing about the amazing results it has brought you.